after the restaurants, what kind of movies do you like? <laughs> Who do you know in this town? And, you, know, you know, all that shit. Gets down to what does it take to make each other come? You know? <laughs> I think for, uh, I think for guys, I don't think we make it that tough, ladies. I, think, I don't think we make it that hard. It isn't like you need an instructional manual to work with us. We're pretty cooperative. <laughs> I don't think we put up a lot of trouble. Just Good morning. It's Thursday, Delta Force Thursday, April the 11th, and this is the True Conservative. Welcome to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there. I'm Ron, your host, and the only true conservative in the United States today. So today, after the Serenity Prayer and the Patriotic Song of the Day, we will have the Patriotic Shorts, Motivation, Bishop Barron, Ayn Rand, the 33 Strategies of War, and Inside Delta Force. All that and more when I get back. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I should not change, the courage to change the things I should, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. Thank you, thank you. Now, some uh, combat radio, and this is from Vietnam. More specifically, March 30th, 1969. <laughs> Roger that, rolling in. I'm ready. Roll this 
Pigpen and Waldo made it back, but several aircraft were disabled or shot down that day. With the help of the gunships, the slick helicopters were able to extract all of the troops just in time. And that was uh, Combat Radio. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. Now the Patriotic Shorts. In 1999, the world was shocked when an old Soviet Union missile shot down the American F-117 Nighthawk stealth aircraft. At that time, the Nighthawk was on a mission to bomb military installations in Belgrade, Serbia. The Nighthawk was supposed to be accompanied by an EA-6B Prowler, whose job was to monitor enemy radar. However, the Prowler wasn't flown due to bad weather, leaving the Nighthawk to fly without the intended support. The Nighthawk's route had been previously passed, and Serbia had deployed the P-18 radar and the S-125 Neva air defense system, which proved effective in detecting the Nighthawk. Despite the vague radar readings, the Nighthawk was successfully locked on, and two missiles were launched. The first missile didn't hit the aircraft, but the second hit its left wing, causing it to spin uncontrollably and ultimately crash. I was one of the first few guys into this dark structure. It's early morning, so it's still dark out. And I went in, and I just saw that was the direction to go. There's no lights in the house. I'm on nods. My nods hit the overhang. We're really clearing this house. I can't just, hey, hold on, guys. Let me fix my nods. And so I just turned and did what you're trained to do. I turned, and I went to a stairwell, which is right next to me. And the guy behind me, he picked up the spot right behind me. I'm 5'10", is at least 6'3". He walks down this hallway, and immediately, it's like... There was a barricaded shooter with a shotgun aimed just up the hallway, and he was aiming roughly at where he thought someone's head would be, but so tall, it hit him here. It hit his plates, and it was a slug, too. Destroyed his plates. He was able to engage, and so that guy was disposed of, but if I hadn't hit that overhang, I'm dead. He ended up living through that, and he lived through the second one, but that one actually haunts me in some ways more than the other. Using sign language, because of all the battle noise, I told one of my men to go up there and throw a grenade over the top and he thought i meant to throw it from her and it, it he did and it landed in front and didn't do any damage so rather than waste any more time i told my men to hold their fire don't shoot me up you know as best i could and i ran across about 30 meters of, of open terrain and ran to the bunker and uh, threw a grenade over the top and then went around to the left side there were still some bad guys that were trying to shoot me and i was able to you know shoot them with my m16 rifle do you know in Band of Brothers, the scene when a German colonel gives a pistol to Winters as a formal surrender, 
actually happened, but the real story of this incident is actually much more interesting than it is presented in the show. In reality Winters took the pistol and later found out that it has never been fired. He kept the gun until he died and assured in an interview that it had not been fired once. He said he liked that the piece had been sealed by the act of offering the gun that has no blood on it. I signed up at Fort Monroe, Virginia to go into the 506 parachute infantry. Nothing has ever been before or since of what they put us through, including the running, the training, and also the obstacle course that was, we said, developed by the devil himself. They almost killed all of us. But on train, troop train, we knew that it was going to New York, and that, therefore, we knew we were going to go to England. We trained very seriously in England because we knew this was the word to do. And this was in September 1943. When I was young, this was normal. It's normal to kill people. It's normal to go into a house and kill people. And sometimes they're with their families. Sometimes they're in bed with their wives, and you still kill them. Um, I, I got to a point, and it seemed normal. It's not normal to do that. It's not normal to kill people, kill people every night. And um, I got to a point with some of this crew, we were killing so many people. We came up with something like, when we go into a room, you have one second to convince me not to. And it was just it. And it, it was a, uh, it was the more kills, the more cool you were. And this is, killing people is not natural, not for a normal person, but that's how we were thinking. And uh, now those ghosts haunt me. And, um, th and I'm not the only one that feels like that. A lot of guys feel like that, but the issue is a lot of veterans don't bring that up because they don't want to seem weak. Um, but once you get into a, a normal life, it really haunts you because now you're not going from the kill house to the shower to the ready room with your boys, with your squadron, with other squadrons. Now you're like transitioning to the private sector. Hey, to each his own, 2023, you do you, I don't give a shit. I was a nervous little kid. We were at a funeral for my little cousin, Teresa, eight years old. And my mother, uh, who had lost her voice before this, it suddenly came back to her when they were lowering the casket. She screamed, Teresa, as they're lowering the casket. I'm just a little five-year-old. I had a fear of death after that for a long time. There's another incident my grandfather. They had wakes in the homes. So I uh, went to uh, the wake in a, in a home in Boston, and uh, the casket was in a bay window, and uh, it was open. And uh, I was standing uh, very close to him, everybody in the kitchen speaking Italian, English, laughing, crying, drinking, eating. I was a be bewildered little kid, so I had that experience when I was five and again seven with death. And so uh, that's why I, I was a nervous little kid. The 9,700-pound little boy atomic bomb drops free from the bomb bay doors. Colonel Tibbetts immediately throws the B-29 into a 155-degree hard turn to get away from the blast zone as quickly as possible. At the same time, escorting B-29, the great artiste, drops instrument-bearing parachutes which will measure the impact of the explosion before also turning away. On the ground, Hiroshima's streets are packed with early morning rush hour traffic, and its residents have no idea of the impending catastrophe about to befall them. In the preceding days, American aircraft had dropped leaflets warning civilians to evacuate the city, but these are mostly ignored. An internal radar system tracks the bomb's descent as it plummets to Earth, traveling over five miles from the release point. At 1,968 feet above the ground, the radar altimeter and barometric sensors initiate the detonation. By some miracle, those machine guns stopped to reload or to change barrels or something. I got up and ran toward the cliffs. And while I was running, they got started again. And they were firing at me. And I said, God, what is happening? I'm getting fired at. I can't see anybody to shoot back at. I made it to the cliff without a scratch. He was a star golfer at Wake Forest, compiling an impressive amateur resume when he suddenly quit school. He was disconsolate over the sudden death of his best friend, Buddy Worsham, in a car accident and needed a change of scenery. Arnold Palmer called his father, Deacon Palmer, to break the startling news. I'm joining the Coast Guard, he informed his shocked father. I don't want to play golf anymore. You better know what you're doing, boy, was the curt response. Arnold Palmer served three years in the Coast Guard, 
and a year after his discharge would go on to win the U.S. Amateur Golf Championship. That victory would serve as a springboard to one of the greatest careers in golf history, and he would go on to revolutionize both the sport and product endorsements. It was three of the best years of my life, Arnie once said of his time in the Coast Guard. The knowledge and maturity that I gained in the Coast Guard was unbelievable. It made me a better person. And that was the Patriotic Shorts. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, a little bit of motivation. If you've ever had a moment in your life that you have measured yourself and come up short, if you've ever poured yourself into an individual, a company, a ministry, a place, or thing, and didn't get the results you expected, if you've ever been good to somebody who wasn't good back, if you've ever given your best to somebody and they act like it wasn't nothing at all, then this one is for you. And too many times... I let my disappointments destroy my faith. The invisible prison of disappointment keeps you from trying, keeps you from giving, keeps you from risking. So if you've been disappointed lately, this is what I want to tell you. That can either be a prison or a portal. A portal leads to something greater. A prison keeps you where you are. This is your decision to make. To come out of what you thought God was going to do, what you thought life was going to do, what you thought you were going to be. And that's the prison that keeps you from seeing how far you've actually come. Frustration is disappointment hiding in your chest. Screaming out of your belly. And I thought it would be better than this. I thought it would be better. By now, I thought I would be further than this. By now, I thought I would have my life together. By now, I thought I would be married. By now, I thought I would be in college. Frustration comes through what you thought. When what you thought doesn't happen, you get frustrated. Anytime you change the game, we get frustrated. What you see us screaming at the TV set about, we're screaming inside about because somebody changed the game or change your body or change your job or change your family we may not say anything we may smile while we gotta smile but inside there is a raging inferno cause we don't understand why it doesn't work like we thought it ought to be working And you are frustrated because you thought that by now you would be further than you are. You thought that at your age you would have more than you do. You thought that at your age you would have proven who you are. And what you envisioned for yourself didn't happen. And you're angry with yourself. And when you get angry with yourself, you beat yourself. You're angry over what didn't work. You're angry over the reaction you didn't get. You're angry over what didn't happen to you as a child or as a man. And that frustration is driving you wild. The first time we get turned away, we go home. The first person that doesn't like us, the the first time it gets a little hard, many of us are so quick to see disappointment as a dead end. If there's no room for us through that door, we will climb up. Here's the word of the Lord. If you can't get in, go up. If you can't get through on this level, go up to a higher level. Sometimes the reason God allows you to be restricted is because you're at the wrong level. And sometimes he'll put a disappointment in your life so you have to climb over it. I know some people didn't like you, didn't promote you, didn't endorse you, didn't support you, but get over it. Sometimes life can really hijack your fucking mind. When that happens to you, you're all fucked up. Your goals, your ambitions, everything's out the fucking window. In life, we all go through different things. Sometimes your girlfriend or boyfriend breaks up with you. Guess what? Get the fuck over it. They no longer want you. Maybe you fell a test in school. You worked your ass off. Guess what? You fell the fucking test. Get over it. Move past it. Life will hijack your mind if you let it. Don't allow all these things to make you a lesser person. You must own your 
mine. Don't let life own yours. And that was a little bit of motivation. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now the uh, Daily Law for April 11th. April 11th. Appeal to people's self-interest. The shortest and best way to make your fortune is to let people see clearly that it is in their interests to promote yours. Jean de la Broyere. In your quest for power, you will constantly find yourself in the position of asking for help from those more powerful than you. There is an art to asking for help, an art that depends on your ability to understand the person you are dealing with and to not confuse your needs with theirs. Most people never succeed at this because they are completely trapped in their own wants and desires. They start from the assumption that the people they are appealing to have a selfless interest in helping them. They talk as if their needs mattered to these people who probably couldn't care less. Sometimes they refer to larger issues, a great cause, or grand emotions, such as love and gratitude. They go for the big picture when simple, everyday realities would have much more appeal. What they do not realize is that even the most powerful person is locked inside needs of his own, and that if you make no appeal to his self-interest, he merely sees you as desperate, or at best, a waste of time. Daily Law When asking for anything, uncover something in your request that will benefit the person you are asking and emphasize it out of all proportion. They will respond enthusiastically when they see something to be gained for themselves. The 48 Laws of Power Law 13 When asking for help, appeal to people's self-interest never to their mercy or gratitude. And that was The Daily Law for April 11th from the book The Daily Laws by Robert Greene. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, Bishop Robert Barron. I think our Protestant friends often say this and understand it better than we do. I mean the power of this word. When you allow the divine word to come into your life, it changes you. You can't really read the Bible. And I mean now Torah, Covenant, Prophet, Old Testament. And of course, I mean reading about the Lord Jesus. You can't read the Bible without being changed. If you just a little bit open your mind and your heart to this word, this word that made the universe, you won't be the same person afterwards. It'll make you more alive. It'll make you more generous. It'll make you more joyful. And that was Bishop Robert Barron, back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, the Ayn Rand thought of the day. Quote, The purpose of morality, Rand argues, is to teach us how to live and achieve happiness. Happiness, the emotional expression and counterpart of the successful state of life, is not achieved by following stray opinions or pursuing random kicks. It is the effect of a complex cause. To achieve it, we must systematically investigate its cause. We must carefully examine the basic nature of reality, of human life, and of what is required from us to thrive in reality. And that was the Ayn Rand thought of the day, back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. Now we uh, return to and pick up where we left off on the 30 Part 5. Unconventional, Dirty Warfare. A general fighting a war must constantly search for an advantage over the opponent. The greatest advantage comes from the element of surprise, from hitting enemies with strategies that are novel, outside their experience, completely unconventional. It is in the nature of war, however, that over time, any strategy with any possible application will be tried and tested so that the search for the new and unconventional 
has an innate tendency to become more and more extreme. At the same time, moral and ethical codes that governed warfare for centuries have gradually loosened. These two effects dovetail into what we today call dirty war, where anything goes, down to the killing of thousands of unwarned civilians. Dirty war is political, deceptive, and supremely manipulative. Often the last recourse of the weak and desperate, it uses any means available to level the playing field. The dynamic of the dirty has filtered into society and the culture at large. Whether in politics, business, or society, the way to defeat your opponents is to surprise them, to come at them from an unexpected angle. And the increasing pressures of these daily wars make dirty strategies inevitable. People go underground. They seem nice and decent, but use slippery, devious methods behind the scenes. The unconventional has its own logic that you must understand. First, nothing stays new for long. Those who depend on novelty must constantly come up with some fresh idea that goes against the orthodoxies of the time. Second, people who use unconventional methods are very hard to fight. The classic direct route, the use of force and strength, does not work. You must use indirect methods to combat indirection. Fight fire with fire, even at the cost of going dirty yourself. To try to stay clean out of a sense of morality is to risk defeat. The chapters in this section will initiate you into the various forms of the unorthodox. Some of these are strictly unconventional, deceiving your opponents and working against their expectations. Others are more political and slippery, making morality a strategic weapon, applying the arts of guerrilla warfare to daily life, mastering the insidious forms of passive aggression, and some are unapologetically dirty, destroying the enemy from within, inflicting terror and panic. These chapters are designed to give you a greater understanding of the diabolical psychology involved in each strategy, helping to arm you with the proper defense. And that was uh, the beginning part of Part 5, Unconventional Dirty Warfare, from the 33 Strategies of War by Robert Green. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. If you're a Democrat, a right-thinking Democrat, you need to vote Republican and become a Republican. We are the true party of government. We are the ones that love government. The Democrat Party just loves power. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. So I'm going to play a little clip from uh, Maria Bartiromo. This is from um, her Sunday show, um, March the 10th. And uh, she's interviewing Laura Trump, who's just been um, elected co-chair of the RNC. And so Laura is telling her what her priorities are. And there's one particular part of this I want you to hear. Integrity division. This means vast resources dedicated solely to this cause. We are going to have, and we've already started working on, and I'll tell you Monday, we're going to expand all of it, a nationwide network of volunteers, whether it's poll watchers, trained poll workers. These are people who can physically go in, count ballots that are coming in, know how many are coming in, how many are going out, volunteer and paid attorneys. If you are a an attorney who wants to volunteer, we want you, DonaldJTrump.com, GOP.com, please come volunteer. And we currently have 78 lawsuits out right now in 23 states across this country to make it easier to vote and harder to cheat. And here's what I want to say. So that was the, the last part was the, the point I was trying to make is that little slogan, easier to vote, harder to cheat. If the Republicans want to win on this issue, they want um, a, people to, to show ID. Now, the left is materialistic. They like to talk about things that you can touch and feel. The Republicans need to respond with concepts and abstractions. So 
uh, voter ID becomes voter uh, vote security. Make sure that your vote is secure. Or to put it into a, um, a slogan form, easier to vote, harder to cheat. So that when anybody comes to you and says, um, hey, uh, are you for um, ID using IDs at uh, the polls? You can say, I'm for making it easier to vote, harder to cheat, and walk away. So again, it's uh, stay conceptual and use the slogans. Yes, facts are important, but propaganda is power. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. So uh, on uh, Maria Bartiromo Sunday or Sunday Futures with Maria Bartiromo, there's, they're interviewing a, a Georgia congressman uh, asking him about the money that Joe Biden promised to uh, build, rebuild the bridge in uh, Maryland, the one that was uh, knocked over uh, not too long ago. And uh, again, uh, and he does this, and Democrats do this all the time, they bait the Republicans into this uh, situation where the Republicans then are uh, think they have to stand up and say, no, 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 no. Uh, and, and the Democrats then get to be the, the heroes because they're offering something. Hey, we're offering to pay for this. The federal government's offering to pay for this bridge. And uh, the Republicans are offering nothing. They're offering a zero. They're offering uh, excuses or... Uh, yeah, excuses. Let's put it that way. So, uh, and again, again, the Republicans are taking the bait. What the Republicans should be doing in this particular situation, as a matter of strategy and tactics, is offering a counter. They should come up with a counter proposal. No, no, no. It, because you can say no, you can say no, then negotiate, or you can say yes with conditions. So, in this particular case, they could say no. We're not going to go ahead and pay for the whole thing, but this is what we will do. Uh, let's say fire the, all the the federal regulators that are responsible for uh, this tragedy because this should have been shouldn't have ever happened. So we're going to start with uh, the Department of Transportation. We're going to zero out the the secretary's uh, payroll so he gets no money and uh, all the people all the way down something like that. So yeah, you're offering at least a little something. No, then negotiate. So. Another way is yes with conditions. Sure, we're going to do this, uh, but this is the way we're going to do it. We're going to uh, give you tax cuts instead. So uh, we'll, there'll be targeted tax cuts for the residents in and around the, air, the affected area. You, the point is to offer something. If you just say no, particularly when you're not in a position where you have the authority to say no. If I'm at home and I'm dealing with my kids and they say, can I have ice cream? I can say no. And, and that's it. There's, there's nowhere to, for the kids to appeal. I have the authority to say no, and that's the end of it. Uh, in the situation with this bridge, they don't necessarily have the Congress alone to say no, the, the Senate has something to say about it. And it's also a Republican-Democrat issue where uh, Republicans don't have the authority all by themselves to say no. The Democrats are going to have something to say about it. It also, again, puts the Republicans in a bad position where they're offering the, the people uh, nothing, whereas the Democrats can say, hey, look, we're offering to fix the bridge. We're offering to pay to fix this bridge. So another thing the Republicans could do is say, uh, sure, we'll go ahead and do that, but we'll take the money out of the Transportation Department budget. We will reallocate resources within the Department of Transportation to pay for this bridge. See, that's an even better one. Then let the Democrats howl. Uh, I still I think the tax cuts is the best idea because the Democrats hate tax cuts. They absolutely hate it. So if you come out and start talking about tax cuts in order to uh, benefit uh, these people directly and indirectly, the Democrats are sure to howl about it. And then what we've set up is uh, an interesting and winnable dynamic in which uh, the Democrats are offering something, we're offering something. And then it's just a matter of sales. Who can sell the public on that, that their idea is better? 
And uh, that's what, again, that's what the Republicans should be doing. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. The root cause is you. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. Now we're going to pick up where we left off on uh, the inside Delta Force. Answers? No. I never got any answers to my questions about that mission. Only orders to shut up. I did as I was told. In the private world of my own thoughts, I never stopped wondering what it was all really about. If Kiki had really gone over to the Sandinistas or if he was just an expendable pawn in another incomprehensible game. I just kept my thoughts to myself as my own disillusion and distrust continued to grow. To this day, I'm still not sure I have any real answers. I believe this to the core of my being. When he was killed, Kiki Sainz was still working for the United States. But the world kept revolving. The passage of the seasons marked our circuit around the sun and the assumption of bowstring force marked our own method of tracking the years. By midsummer 1986, I was serving in the Selection and Training Detachment as the senior instructor for OTC. I had moved over to S&T earlier in the year after being injured on a mission with the British Special Air Service. I had completely recovered from the physical damage, but truth be told, I was tired. I was slow to admit it to myself, but the last eight years had taken a toll. The life of a Delta Force operator was physically demanding. You had to keep the fitness level of a professional athlete with no off-season. But more than that, it extracted a decided mental and emotional cost, and that, ultimately, was more draining than anything else. For a few months, I had been toying with the idea of finding another assignment. Overseas somewhere, or maybe back with one of the Ranger battalions. It was a hard decision to make, because from here, there was no such thing as up. Professionally, any change from Delta Force would be a retrograde, and every time I started to give it some serious thought, I would be overcome with a sense of guilt. We had lost a lot of men, with debilitating injuries, retirements, reassignments, and deaths. We were barely keeping up with attrition. It was all we could do to keep our personnel numbers at anything close to the unit requirement. And if I elected to leave now, I would be deserting the unit and just adding to the problem. Then the decision was taken out of my hands. When the results of the recently concluded Sergeant Major's promotion board were released, I had been selected by the Department of the Army for promotion to the rank of Sergeant Major. But there was more. A subsequent board had been conducted to select candidates for appointment to the rank of Command Sergeant Major, the highest non-commissioned rank in the Army, and I was one of the handful of soldiers selected for that position. It was unbelievable. At one month short of my 34th birthday, I was the youngest man ever selected for appointment to CSM. Now, I would have to find a new home. There is only one Command Sergeant Major in any organization. Dan Simpson was our current CSM, And as he jokingly told me, Haney, I ain't leaving just because you're getting promoted. That settled it. If the Army was good enough to honor me with promotion to the highest position an NCO could ever hope for, I would repay the honor the best way I knew how. I would return to the regular infantry, where the rubber really meets the road, and give back to the units who carry the brunt of warfare as much of what I had learned in the last 16 years as I could. When I considered where I would like to serve, there was only one answer, Panama. Things were happening down there. I was always going in and out of Panama on missions to Central and South America, and occasionally I would bump into old friends who were stationed there with the 193rd Infantry Brigade. There was another attraction. One of these days, we were going to have to sort things out with the Noriega regime, and when it happened, I wanted to be in on the action. I placed a call to the Sergeant Major's assignment branch at the Army's Military Personnel Center. I was prepared for a long, arduous campaign of negotiation to wrangle the assignment, 
But when I told the man on the other end of the line that what I'd really like was a posting to Panama, the immediate reply was, can you be there a week from now? I shook off my surprise and answered very quickly, no, but I can be there in 30 days. The response was just as rapid. Okay, orders for permanent change of station are on the way. Call me back if you haven't received them by day after tomorrow. That was it. I stopped by to let Dan know I'd start out processing in a couple of days. The timing would work perfectly. We were constructing a new compound for the unit, and it was just about ready. I made up my mind that I would never set foot in the new building as an operator. Instead, I would leave this place for the last time on our final day in the original facility. That way, I would forever be a stockade man. And that's exactly how it worked out. When an operator leaves the unit, there is no sentimental display, no parties, no extended farewells, just a quiet handshake with friends and comrades. And that's the way it should be for an organization with a mission like ours. On my last day in the unit, I had lunch in the mess hall with some of my old mates from the selection and training detachment. The place was pretty quiet. B Squadron was off in the Middle East chasing an airplane, and A Squadron was out at the drop zone working on a new parachute infiltration technique. The OTC students were out at the range, so there was just a handful of us old-timers gathered around a large table. I'm going to miss these guys, I thought looking around the table at my friends. We've gone through a lot together, these good men and I. And there are a lot of other good men who are no longer here with us, men who have fallen over the years. But there was no need to be maudlin. The Army is a self-replicating organism, and so is Delta Force. People come and people go, but the unit and what it stands for will live forever. Now it was the time of departure. I was sitting in my truck, in my old parking spot on the lane to the shooting house, taking a last look around. I cranked the engine and headed out. I didn't want to become teary-eyed and embarrass myself at this late date. I stopped at the gate to turn in my badge and say goodbye to the guards. Then I drove outside the fence for the last time. I glanced in the rearview mirror as I pulled onto Butner Road and turned right, coasting slowly downhill. The reflection of the concertina wire atop the screened fence was visible for just a moment longer, until I turned the first curve. Then it was gone. And uh, that was Inside Delta Force. So there is uh, 30 minutes of this book left. So if uh, I don't finish it next Thursday, then definitely uh, the Thursday after. Back in a minute. This is Ron, your host, the only uh, true conservative in the United States today, bidding adios to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there and reminding you that you are not neutral and that the government has no rights. <laughs> 